The biggest hurdle for small developers is discovery. They depend on the press to get noticed at all. That's why it always saddens me to see so many best of lists featuring the same mega sellers that everyone's heard of already. So today, I'm presenting some underappreciated titles. These games aren't truly obscure, they've done relatively well, but still don't get the media love they deserve. The main thing they have in common is that I like them and I think they should be more popular than they are. Some games struggle because their design is just too unorthodox to explain in a brief marketing blurb. The Magic Circle, which I could best describe as an open-world adventure game, a strange beast if there ever was one, definitely falls into that category. The Magic Circle puts the player in the role of an error in the system. The story centers around a fictional game, also called The Magic Circle, that has been caught in development hell for decades. The fault lies with the game's auteur developer, who can be heard bickering with his long-suffering team members throughout the game. But there are secrets aplenty, both within the game within a game, and in the characters surrounding it, and the player will ultimately decide the fate of this doomed game. The objective in the Magic Circle is a simple one. Reach a walled-off part of the game that's on the other side of a chasm and a pack of angry enemies. Lacking any means of self-defense, let alone flight, the player is instead gifted with the ability to create magical traps. By snaring characters in the game, the player can manipulate their attributes, turning friends into foes, taking traits from one creature and giving them to another, and so forth. There is a ready means to solve all of the game's puzzles, but the player also has the tools to seek out new and creative solutions. I have a soft spot for the odd, and this one qualifies in spades. Super Daryl Deluxe is a Metroidvania platformer RPG that stands out for its wonderfully bizarre visuals and story. That story puts the player in the loafers of Daryl Whitelaw, the undisputed Lord of the Dorks. He's a transfer student to Water Falls, a high school best known for producing two students who caused the world's most mundane apocalypse. He shows up on a day commemorating said apocalypse, and it's immediately obvious that something isn't right. Most of the student body is missing, many of the classrooms have turned into sprawling pocket dimensions, and the way the teacher's eyes are glowing is a bit disconcerting. Daryl's goal is just to get from one day to the next, which isn't so easy when every room is full of history's greatest monsters brought to life. To defend himself, Daryl obtains a range of offensive powers by trading in textbooks, a rare and precious good in Water Falls. Daryl's powers are a diverse lot, and while the early stages of the game can be completed simply by spamming a few basic attacks, the later enemies and bosses require tactical use of some of Daryl's more exotic gifts. It's possible that some of you are familiar with an earlier iteration of this game titled Earthlock Festival of Magic. Earthlock, sans subtitle, is a re-release and upgrade that significantly improved the experience in many ways, reinserting a mountain of cut content, balancing the characters, and making the story, well, present. Earthlock is a throwback JRPG set on a planet that doesn't spin and the days and nights are fixed, hence the title. The story follows your typical ragtag RPG crew who go on an adventure and blunder into a secret plan by the big bad. Nah, you've seen it before. It's a vintage story that harkens back to RPGs of the sixth generation, and indeed the game's aesthetics and design are based on the days of the PS2. Where Earthlock really stands out is in its mechanics. While sticking to classic turn-based combat, the game adds a number of twists, including switchable stances with different move sets and an experience system that rewards the player for tackling more technically challenging fights. Add in the detailed graphic design, and you have something that should appeal to any aficionado of 2000s-era RPGs. I could easily fill this list with all of the great twin-stick and gallery shooters no one talks about, but in the name of keeping things simple, I'll limit myself to one of the more polished of the bunch. Bot Vice is the product of DYA Games, a studio specializing in games that imitate the look and feel of classic arcade titles, especially Neo Geo. This one sees protagonist Aaron Saver blasting her way through armies of robots and voice acting so bad that it has to be intentional. 
She has a pretty expansive toolkit to achieve that goal, along with the obligatory firearm and power-ups. She also has a variety of defensive measures, including a dodge roll and a bullet deflecting blade. Now aesthetically, Bot Vice is simply nicer to look at than most pixel art games, with more attention paid to the palettes and animations than you usually saw from games released in this period. Add to that its surprising replay value with lots of bonus stages and challenges for people with arcade caliber skills, and you have something that's well worth its small price. I've often wondered if Underhero suffered from being mixed up with that other game featuring that other rabidly zealous and not at all disturbing fanbase. Well, hmm. Underhero places the player in the role of a cannon fodder bad guy, a masked kid, one of many meant to serve as speed bumps for the hero. But everything changes when this particular masked kid accidentally kills the hero and claims his magical, talking, shape-shifting weapon. Sensing an opportunity to take over the show, the masked kid's boss, one Mr. Stitches, sends his peon on a quest to defeat all of the other bosses. Needless to say, though, there's more than meets the eye here. At heart, Under Hero is a game that idolizes the Paper Mario games, with a similar gameplay style and stylized cartoon-like graphics. It is a platformer with RPG combat, but everything is action-driven. No grinding for success here. Winning fights means learning how to read an enemy's behavior, dodge or counter their attacks, and then retaliate with the best weapon for the job. The combat system is easy but engaging, and just about anyone should be able to get a handle on it. I feel like the original Evo Land is fairly well known, but the far more substantial sequel has been a little bit lost. Now, the original Evo Land was an interesting exploration of action adventure and RPG mechanics past, but it was ultimately more of an interactive museum exhibit than a game. Evo Land 2 takes that concept, adds a proper narrative, and carries it on an adventure across time and space. Taking control of an amnesiac, time-hopping mystery man, the player must gather a typically ragtag assortment of allies on a journey to figure out why he was sent through time in the first place. Now, the original Evo Land was known for switching its genre at will, paying homage to famous titles with loving mockery, mainly The Legend of Zelda and Final Fantasy. In the follow-up, the list has gotten a bit longer. We're talking Street Fighter, 1942, Bomberman, Advance Wars, Professor Layton, Chrono Trigger, Puzzle Fighter, Dance Dance Revolution, Double Dragon. While the game is not overly difficult, the diversity in the gameplay can nevertheless be a real test of skill, and surprisingly, it never feels unfocused. The transition from genre to genre actually feels very natural to the story. 